so here is a simple problem a basic problem you can say on electromagnetic induction uh, understanding of electromagnetic induction so let me read the problem for you first a thin rod of length l is falling vertically downwards in a magnetic field which is uniform and directed vertically upwards and the options which are given are an emf is induced in it if it is falling with velocity parallel to its length an emf is induced in it if its velocity if it is falling with velocity perpendicular to its length no emf is induced and emf is induced if velocity is uniform So, in the first two options he has talked about how is that particular wire of length L or rod of length L is falling. See, it may be falling with its length perpendicular to the velocity, it may be falling like this or it may be falling like this with its length parallel to the velocity, right. But how is the magnetic field? It is uniform and it is directed vertically upwards. So, the charge carriers inside this conductor or you can say the free electrons in this conductor are not going to experience any force whether the rod falls with its length perpendicular to the velocity or it falls with its length parallel to the velocity because how is the force experienced by the charge particles given q v cross b fine ok. So, angle between v and b being 180 degree sin of 180 is 0 therefore, they will not experience any force at all and if they do not experience any force there will not be any charge separation and if there is no charge separation there is not going to be any emf induced across the length of the rod. You might have felt that if the rod is falling like this there is no scope for the charges to get separated lengthwise sorry breadthwise or you can say this area is negligible. So, you might all of a sudden feel that if the rod were to be falling like this then definitely the charges would have got separated along the length of the rod and there could have been an emf induced between the two ends of the rod fine but irrespective of whether the rod falls like this or like this there is not going to be any emf induced in the rod because the charges will not experience any force due to the magnetic field so which is the right option here no emf is going to be induced so that's the correct option So, here is uh, a slightly better problem than the previous one. I told you the previous one was just to make you understand the basic thing, right. So, here uh, it is slightly better. A rod of length L rotates with a small but uniform angular velocity omega about its perpendicular bisector. A uniform magnetic field B exists parallel to the axis of rotation. The potential difference between the center of the rod and an end is 0, 1 by 8, 1 by 2, omega b l square. So, those are the options. See, last time the rod was falling vertically downwards and the magnetic field was also vertically upwards, right. So, there was no charge separation created. Now, the beauty of this problem is the rod has got the velocity no doubt and the velocity is continuously changing from one end of the rod to the other end. The reason for this is the rod is rotating last time it was only translating the rod was only falling vertically downwards. So, every particle belonging to the rod had the same velocity in magnitude and direction definition of translatory motion. But now the rod is rotating. So, once the rod starts rotating I hope you agree and especially when the rotation is fixed axis here the axis is passing through the center of the rod and perpendicular to its length. So, if the rod rotates like this purely uh, about a particular axis fixed axis every point belonging to the rod will have a different velocity and that velocity will be directly proportional to its distance. The velocity of every point will be directly proportional to its distance from the axis of rotation. So, as you move from the axis of rotation its velocity is going to increase. So, every, every part of the rod will have a different velocity and will have a different emf induced across an element there 
right so we are supposed to integrate and write the total emf between the ends of the rod okay so how is the rod rotating let me draw a figure here see this is the rod of length l he says agreed with a small but uniform angular velocity omega is given about its perpendicular bisector see this is the bisecting point of that on that rod and you can say the axis is passing through the perpendicular bisector and uh, perpendicular to the length of the rod a uniform magnetic field b exists parallel to this axis of rotation so he just says that the magnetic field is parallel to this axis of rotation which we have considered perpendicular to the board and perpendicular to the length of the rod but he has not told you whether that magnetic field is into the board or out of the board no problem let us consider that the magnetic field is out of the board fine okay so the magnetic field is out of the board so let me represent it by dot i hope you agree with this convention there because uh, whenever we have something which is perpendicular to the paper perpendicular to the board right we always represent it by either a dot or a cross dot will represent something which is coming out of the paper and cross will represent something which is going into the paper so here i have imagined the magnetic field to be coming out of the board and perpendicular to the board he has not even told you whether that angular velocity is clockwise or anti clockwise that's another thing no problem we will consider it to be anti clockwise so this is how the angular velocity omega is now if you consider one element here see this is the element of the rod a small portion of the rod which i am going to take at a distance of x right so this distance is x and the length of that element that i have taken is dx right so the element has been chosen at a distance of x from the center of the rod and the length of the element that i have chosen is dx and why did i refer to only length of the element that is because the given rod itself has got only length and he is not particular about the area of cross section of the rod so even an element belonging to that rod should also have only a length so dx is the length now what is the velocity of the uh, element there i told you it is directly proportional to the distance so it should be omega x where omega is uniform and it is constant for the whole rod so that velocity will be like this right so this velocity will be omega x omega is constant so directly proportional to the distance okay now what is the emf going to be induced in that small element in that portion the small emf de induced in that element is going to be vbl where v is omega x b is the magnetic field and l is dx remember l is not the length of the whole rod l is only the length of that element so this is the small emf motional emf you can say which is basically because the rod is moving in a magnetic field okay so omega x b into dx is the emf but you should also be having an understanding of which end of that element will become positive and which end will become negative and while explaining this you will also understand the previous uh, problems uh, declare uh, wherein we declared that because the rod was falling with its velocity per, uh, anti parallel to the magnetic field the emf induced in that rod was zero you will also come to know that so which end is going to become positive and which end is going to become negative see the charged particle in that element is having a velocity in this direction and magnetic field is out of the board so if you use your q v cross b which i had used in my previous explanation v is like this b is out of the board so q v cross b will be given by your thumb v like this b out of the board so v cross b will be like this so if the charges that we were referring if the charges that we were talking about were to be positive charges they would have experienced the force towards that side so all the positive charges would have gathered here and the negative charges would have gathered here remember so on the farther end of your element positive charges would have gathered and on the nearer end to the axis you would have had a negative charge but remember what are the charges that you are referring inside a conductor the charge carriers which are nothing but the free electrons and electrons being negatively charged they will not experience the force that way but they will experience the force this way so this end will become positive and that end will become negative the end of the element which is nearer to the axis will become positive and the end which is away from the axis will become negative fine 
Okay. See, velocity q v cross b, the thumb should have represented the force experienced by the positive charge. So, I have taken that thumb inwards. So, this is the EMF and polarity. I hope you understood this. Now, if I integrate this from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to L by 2, I am going to get the total EMF induced between the center and the end and it is only a one step integration. So, I will do it here. So, E equals omega is constant, B is constant and if you integrate x with respect to x, you are going to get x square by 2. right? So, then you can substitute the limits as 0 to L. right? So, that gives you omega B L square, um, Okay, you are required to substitute not 0 to L, but 0 to L by 2. So, if you square L by 2, you will get L square by 4 and there is 1, 2 uh, outside. So, it will be omega B L square by 8. I hope you understood this. See, omega and B are constant. Integration of x with respect to x is x square by 2. So, that 2 we have retained and in place of x, if you substitute L by 2, which is the upper limit, it will become L square by 4. So, L square by 8. So, omega B L square by 8 is the EMF induced between the center of the rod and an end. See, he has asked you what is the potential difference between the center of the rod and an end and that answer is omega B L square divided by 8 which is your B option. But please remember, had he asked you to find out the potential difference between one end of the rod and the other end, the answer would have been 0. Why is that it would have been 0? Because what all we have discussed on one side of the axis in half of the length of the rod would have been the discussion on the other side of the axis in the remaining half of the length of the rod also. Similarly, you could have taken an element here. Similarly, there could have been an EMF induced across that element and then similarly you would have integrated and similarly you would have got an EMF of omega B L square by 8 with a negative sign at this end also. So, this end of the rod is having a negative potential and the EMF is omega B L square by 8 between the end and the axis. Similarly, this end would have still become a zero potential and this end would have become negative. right? So, there is only a potential difference between the center of the rod and an end of the rod, not between one end of the rod and the other end of the rod. So, both the options are given there. Please remember 0 is one option and omega B L square by 8 is another, but this is correct. I hope you enjoyed this problem. So, here is one more beautiful problem on electromagnetic induction. Let us read the problem first so that I can explain you the concept involved. A ring is rotating in a vertical plane about a horizontal axis through its center in a uniform magnetic field also in the plane of the ring. The EMF induced between two diametrically opposite points on its circumference is. See how is the ring rotating? The ring is, see whenever we speak about any rotational motion problem, I think I must have told you earlier also that you should be very particular about how is the axis and how is the plane of rotation. So, here the ring is rotating in a vertical plane. So, the ring is rotating in a vertical plane. So, I have drawn the ring in the plane of the board which is vertical, right, about a horizontal axis, see about a horizontal axis through its center. So, this is the axis the axis should be passing through the center and should be parallel to the floor. right? Okay. But how is it rotating? He has not given whether clockwise or anticlockwise. We will again imagine this to be clockwise. And he has not talked about that angular velocity, but in the options there is an angular velocity there. So, we will imagine the angular velocity to be omega. right? So, it is rotating in the anticlockwise direction with a uniform angular velocity omega. Got it? axis is perpendicular to the uh, plane of the board or it is perpendicular to the plane of the ring. It is a horizontal axis and the ring is rotating in a vertical plane. Okay. Now, how is the magnetic field? In a uniform magnetic field also in the plane of the ring. So, the magnetic field is also in the plane of the ring means the magnetic field is also in the plane of the board. 
okay but he has not told you whether it is vertically upwards or it is horizontal or it is inclined right so we will imagine that to be the, in the most uh, usual way that is say like this so this is the magnetic field the magnetic field is in the plane of the board but because he has not particularly told you whether it is vertical or horizontal we have just imagined it to be inclined and now he is talking about two diametrically opposite points taken on the circumference and an EMF induced between them. So imagine one point here say A and another point here which is B. So those are the two diametrically opposite points or you could have chosen even two points here also. So C and D. So we have two diametrically opposite points there either C and D or A and B and he wants you to tell the potential difference between those two points. But please remember the basic theory involved in electromagnetic induction is whenever there is a change in the flux then only an EMF is going to be induced because EMF electromagnetically induced is given by minus d phi by dt. Fine that minus sign only tells you about the sign of the EMF or the polarity or the direction you can say and d phi by dt implies there should be a rate of change of flux right okay now how is that flux written the flux is written as b dot a remember the flux is written as b dot a how is b here b is out of the board and how is the area vector area vector is also out of the board so when magnetic field is out of the board and the area vector is also out of the board the angle between area vector and magnetic field will be 0 and cos 0 will be 1 and therefore the flux associated with the ring will be b into a and b is also constant area is also constant so there is absolutely no change in the flux involved and when there is no change in the flux there is not going to be any emf induced electromagnetically so what is the right answer here the right answer is zero see i am taking all these basic problems just to make you understand that how should there be a type of uh, motion of the conductor in order that an emf is induced between any two points on the rod we took the first example of a rod falling vertically downwards the second example was a rod rotating and here there is a ring which is rotating but there is no change in the flux associated with the ring so the answer is zero See there is one more uh, very simple problem here, uh, let us read the problem first. Consider the following statements, an EMF can be induced by moving a conductor in a magnetic field. Second statement, an EMF can be induced by changing the magnetic field and the option says A is true, B is false, B is true, A is false, both are true, both are false. So you should uh, remember in this particular chapter of electromagnetic induction that there are two ways of uh, changing the flux. You can either make a conductor move in a magnetic field and sweep an area in the magnetic field and change the flux associated or you can change the magnetic field itself that is you can have a time varying magnetic field. In my previous problem I had taken a ring right and the flux associated with that ring was constant and the reason was the field was uniform. So you wrote B dot A for the flux and that B dot A turned out to be constant. But had the magnetic field continuously changing with respect to time then the flux associated which was B dot A would have changed with time because B was continuously changing with time but the area was constant. So even by changing a magnetic field you can induce an EMF right that is also an electromagnetically induced EMF and by moving a conductor in a magnetic field of course in the previous two problems you might have seen that if we start moving a conductor in a magnetic field there can be an EMF induced. So there are two methods of changing the flux and inducing the EMF. So in this problem what is the right answer? An EMF can be induced by moving a conductor is also correct. An EMF can be induced by changing the magnetic field with time is also correct. So there should be a time varying magnetic field and here you can move a conductor. 
So both A and B are true and that makes your A option perfectly correct. Yes, so here is one more uh, a very conceptual, simple, but a problem which will really make you understand the uh, electromagnetic induction. Fine, let me read the problem first. Two circular loops of equal radii are placed coaxially at some separation. The first one is cut and a battery is inserted to drive a current in it. The current changes slightly because of the variation of the resistance with temperature. During this period, the two loops will attract each other, repel each other, do not exert any force on each other, attract or repel depending on the sense of the current. Those are the options. So why I call this to be a very conceptual problem is because it will really help you understand every detail of this electromagnetic induction. The two rings that he has taken there are of equal radii, fantastic. They are placed coaxially. So these are the two rings which he has held separated by small distance and coaxially. The axis of this ring and the axis of this ring are same. Now he has cut one of the rings and he has inserted a battery, right. So that cutting of the ring is to just insert a battery there so that the battery will start driving a current in that ring, got it, okay. Now he has not told you about the polarity of that battery, again so which end is positive and which end is negative, whether he has inserted the battery here with the positive end upwards or negative end downwards, those things are not given but does not matter, it will just help you to understand the current in the battery, a current in the uh, ring. So this is the ring, imagine that I have cut it here and there is a small battery which is inserted there. The upper end is positive and the lower end is negative. So current will start flowing in the anti-clockwise direction. If I stand in between the two coaxial coils and look at this one, I am in between the two coils remember and I am looking at this coil and I told you how is the current that I am finding in this anti-clockwise because I have imagined the battery's polarity to be positive upwards. So from the positive terminal of the battery. There is a current in the anti-clockwise direction flowing in this ring in which you have made a cut and inserted the battery. No such thing is there in this particular loop, right? This loop is still complete. There is no cutting anywhere, okay? But what will happen? He says as the current starts flowing through this particular coil, slowly the temperature of the coil will increase and when the temperature increases, the resistance also increases. I hope you agree with this. The resistance is directly proportional to the temperature. And I think this is for one reason why we try to maintain the temperature to be constant while verifying Ohm's law, okay. So when the temperature increases, please remember that the resistance also increases and he has just also uh, tried to see whether you understand that particular point or not because he says because of variation of resistance with temperature. So he is talking about only a variation of resistance but we are for sure that the resistance will also increase. And when the resistance increases, the current decreases because the EMF of the battery is fixed, right? The circuit resistance has increased, therefore the current has decreased. And when the current decreases, what will happen? The magnetic field which is, uh, which this ring is going to produce will also decrease. Because if you remember in our previous chapter, we had told you what is the magnetic field produced due to a circular wire carrying the current. And especially when you write the magnetic field at the center of the wire, it is going to be mu naught I divided by 2 R. Fine. So mu naught I divided by 2 R, R stands for the radius of the circular coil and I for the current. And because the current is decreasing, this magnetic field produced at the center of the wire is also going to decrease. And now do not forget that this magnetic field is linked with the neighboring coil. There is one more coil which you have held coaxially at a small separation. So this magnetic field is going to be linked up with this. And how do you write the flux associated with this? B dot A. How is B? I have imagined the current to be anti-clockwise, therefore the magnetic field has to be along the axis 
and directed towards me and this magnetic field which is entering this particular coil is changing. B dot A is the flux but B is changing because the current is changing. So B dot A is also changing. So which means the flux associated with this coaxially placed coil will change with time. And this is one of the reasons why an electromagnetically induced EMF is to be generated. Whenever a flux associated with a particular coil changes, an EMF is induced. So there is going to be an EMF induced in this. Remember, you had not cut this ring, you had not placed any battery, but still the flux associated with this particular ring was changed because of which an EMF was induced. And now this EMF will start driving the current through this coil also. Right? So now there will be a current in this. But remember, because the flux is decreasing, by Lenz law, this has to be opposed. Basically, why is the flux associated with this particular ring changing? It is changing because the magnetic field is decreasing and therefore the flux is also decreasing. And if the flux decreases and it has to be opposed by your Lenz law, this coil has to come closer because so that more amount of lines of force will pass through this particular coil and the flux is uh, opposed from decreasing. This opposing of decrease in the flux is what we explain on the basis of Lenz law. Therefore, the two coils are going to be attracted or there is another explanation which I can give for this. I told you, you were standing in between the two coils. You were looking at this particular uh, coil and I told you the current in this was anticlockwise. So, magnetic field was towards this and the flux associated with this coil was decreasing. And if the flux associated with this coil is decreasing, some more amount of flux has to be made to pass through. And for that, the current in this, when seen by me, should be clockwise. I hope I am not confusing you people. See, I am in the middle of the two coils. I am looking at this coil and the current in this is anti-clockwise. Now, I am trying to see this coil and here I should find the current to be clockwise. Because only when the current is clockwise, the magnetic field produced by that current will be again into the coil. So, the flux associated with this, this coil can be increased slightly in order to oppose the decrease. Got it? Okay. So, now see the current in this is clockwise. So, what pole do you consider this face of the coil to be? This face of the coil can be considered to be the south pole because whenever you look at a particular coil and you find the current to be clockwise, you can call that particular face of the coil to be a south pole. And if you are looking at a coil and you find the current to be anti-clockwise, you can call that face of the coil to be a north pole. So, you are in the middle, you find the current in this coil to be clockwise, so that is a south pole for you and you find the current in this to be anti-clockwise, so that is a north pole for you and north and south should attract each other. I hope you realize this. Therefore, this is a very complete explanation about the option to be selected there. So, they attract each other is the right answer. They do not repel and they do, do not exert any force on each other is ruled out. They attract or repel depending on the sense of the current. What does he mean by the sense of the current there? Because the polarity of the battery that you have inserted in one of the rings is fixed, there is not going to be any change in the direction of the current or the sense of the current. So, last option is also wrong. The correct option is A. And I hope you thoroughly enjoyed this problem and the explanation was quite clear.